Hello and welcome to the big picture. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is about to end his 10-day long tour abroad, one of the longest undertaken by a Prime Minister in recent memory. These 10 days have been packed with important meetings, including the East Asia Summit, ASEAN-India Summit, G20 leaders meet, BRICS leaders meeting, apart from a series of bilateral meetings in Myanmar and Australia. His now familiar outreach to Indians in these countries, especially in Australia, had the same echo run in New York. He has also managed to create a buzz about India, as well as himself, even amid the gathering of world's most powerful leaders. So behind all these obviously impressive meetings and atmospherics, what is it that the Prime Minister has been able to achieve? What is it that India can look forward to from this visit and meetings? What will be the short-term as well as long-term impact? We will discuss all this today. M.K. Badra Kumar, former ambassador and a leading foreign policy analyst, Professor Baradas Goshal, senior fellow, Center for Policy Research, Dilip Cherian, founder of Perfect Relations, and Dr. Didar Singh, Secretary General Fiki. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Mr. Badra Kumar. If you look at these last nine days that he has been in this country, you know, in Myanmar, Australia, what is that one thing which strikes you has been the his most significant achievement? Bhai, I think it is a fortuitous circumstance that uh, there has been a there has been a coming together of so many major international regional events, which doesn't happen normally. It doesn't happen normally. Now, uh, this is very timely because it is happening right at the outset of. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's uh, tenure as Prime Minister. You see, the fact of the matter is that when Narasimha Rao... So he has had he has had the opportunity to meet a whole wide variety yeah, no, of no, leaders. No, 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 it's more fundamental than that. That's what I was coming to. When the, Mr. Prime Minister Narasimha Rao conceived the Lukis policy, there was a certain world situation. And there were certain imperatives for India at that time as a non-aligned country coming out of the bipolar world which disintegrated. And also the economic reform program just being launched at that time in the early 1990s. But then the fact of the matter is that, you know, over time, this Lukis policy uh, got heavily laden with geopolitics. Right. Frankly, in terms of India being a counterweight to China and all sorts of notions. And this reached a peak, in fact, the time of the George Bush administration, when the neocon ideology was permeating everything and Indian think tankers got profoundly influenced. Right. But the point is, this region has not been standing still. It's in a, a stage of a great uh, uh, transformation itself. And now, uh, I think uh, for Prime Minister Narendra Modi, with his uh, action-oriented uh, mindset and his determination to go ahead with the development agenda, there is a very good opportunity that he has got, in my opinion, that's the most important salient of this regional tour, to restructure India's look East policy. See, Hillary Clinton told us, call it Act East. Act East. So we started calling it Act East. But the point is the content is still lacking. And that is where I think the Prime Minister would have applied himself in money in my uh, expectation. The point is, <coughs> this region uh, is in a state of transformation in a major way. There are all kinds of regional economic integration process, the primacy of the development agenda, especially in, in important countries like Indonesia, uh, the ASEAN's relationship with China, uh, all this taking place, plus the United States' inability to sustain that level of influence that it had in the region historically uh, due to its decline and its preoccupations partly in the Middle East and its uh, uh, domestic preoccupations in terms of the recovery of the American economy. All this taken together, there are very many things which are at work in the area. Now, Australia, for example, discussed this. You look at the state of play there, you know, in Australia, Australia's trade relationship with China, bilateral trade is to the volume exceeding $150 billion. Right. Aust China accounts for more than one-third of Australia's all exports and services, uh, goods and services. India's exports to Australia is just $3 billion. So there is a lot of things done there. Now, two major, in the APEC summit in Beijing, which, where India was unfortunately not there, Two major regional projects have got underway. They, they have been underway. They have been in the pipeline. But they are competing for primacy. 
One is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No, we will come to that. But you know, the, the, the issue is about what happened during these 10 days. We are now joined in by Manoj Joshi, senior journalist and a distinguished fellow at the Observer Foundation. Welcome, Manoj. Manoj, my question to you is the same which I was asking uh, Badr Kumar also. If you look back at, at these last nine, 10 days of, uh, nine days of the Prime Minister's visit abroad in Myanmar and Australia, what is, it, what is that one thing which you think he has achieved which will have some lo lasting uh, benefit for the country? Well, I think uh, the most important thing from my point is that at least our lead batsman has gone out to bat. I think this is the beginning of that process because, uh, and I deliberately say beginning, uh, because, you know, we are far behind, far, far behind everyone else. We are, uh, our own economy uh, needs to get into a high sustainable, uh, high growth path. Uh, and then only can we really engage with this region in a very substantive way. So what has happened is that our batsman is there and I think he has, uh, he, uh, he's a showman. And I think what he has done is uh, that he has uh, signaled to the people with his energy and uh, with the, uh, uh, and in his, uh, if you noticed in his speech yesterday in Australia, he very categorically and clearly laid out the achievements of his very short tenure so far. He spoke, for example, about the Jandhan Yojana, then he spoke about the, the decisions he had taken on FDI. Then he spoke, uh, you know, so he, the, the point that he made was that I am here. I've started taking decisions. Watch this space. And I think this is an extremely important signal to the region because everyone was somewhat despondent. You know, they want, it's not that they want India to play, um, uh, in, uh, to play off India against China, but they want an important counterweight uh, which will help them to negotiate their situation with China in a better fashion, in a more productive fashion. Otherwise, what happens is that China will simply come on too heavy. And I think um, um, uh, Ambassador just pointed out, uh, you know, the extent of the Australian um, uh, trade um, uh, exports to uh, China. Uh, China. Now, that's actually an imbalance, meaning I think uh, the, too much of it is going to China. Some of it, uh, a lot of it should come our way as well. And I think if we balance this out, it will be to the mutual benefit of all the countries uh, of the region. Okay. Uh, Dr. Didar Singh, how would you look at this, uh, you know, especially the, the one on trade, you know, what happened in, uh, in Myanmar, the, the in, in, in the Indo-US deal, which is expected to lead to the FTA being signed, do you, do you think that this is something which, which uh, uh, should be looked at more closely? Oh uh, yeah, I would tend to agree with what uh, Manoj said and what Ambassador said. You know, when you look at this entire look east kind of policy that we are talking about. Yeah, please continue. Remember, we are not the only people looking east. There are a large number of, I mean, if you look at it at a geopolitical as well as a geoeconomic situation. Please continue, sir. The east is where the agenda is today. I think I, and therefore no, is there, I Prime think Minister I think Modi there's a problem out in places Dr. Didar Singh I think we'll, we'll set, I think there's a okay. there and we'll, we'll settle that problem we'll come, I'll come back to you uh, Professor Goshal yeah. okay all right one all one right. particular thing if you have to lay your finger on which you think, think that you know this is something which which will have a long term repercussions and I think in my opinion in regard to the Lucas policy what Modi has done this time the one sort of kind of meant is that he has been able to give an at least an assurance that he will be able to at least he will try to breach the gap between the expectations from the ASEAN countries and what India has been doing all these years. I think there has been a lot of expectation from the countries of Southeast Asia for India to play a much more important role, not only in terms of secure structure in the region, but also in terms of economic engagement. Now, on both those counts, India was very hesitant in terms of even regional economic integration and economic sort of you know, uh, agreements that were signed in the past. There were a lot of hesitations and even those that were passed that trade agreement with ASEAN that was passed almost after seven years of, you know, haggling and kind of thing. So I think for the first time, I think Modi has given a kind of an indication that he would be a little bit more serious about, uh, you know, paying much greater attention. And there is now one more important thing that has come out in terms of our relationship with Myanmar. 
you know, for the first time, the Myanmaris, at least the president, had expressed visions in terms of brotherly relations. You know, in the case of China, they used to refer to as relations with cousins. <laughs> now, this itself is a great improvement in terms of, you know, how Myanmar looks towards India. Now, I think it is up to Modi and also to the Indian establishment to at least implement what India has been promised all this year. In fact, his entire lookist policy is a lot of assurances, but in terms of actual sort of implementation, I think it's, it's much to be desired. Now, until and unless that is sort of, you know, that gap is reduced, I think there will always be a kind of a skepticism in the minds of many of these countries of the region about India's ability to deliver things. India will not be in the antenna of many of these countries, uh, even though they have been talking about Modi and all the halo that he has been creating about. But much will depend on how things are implemented and to what extent, uh, what Modi has been talking about linking development and foreign policy, how he is able to give a shape to it. He has not been able to do anything so far, only he has given a vision and about it. Okay, uh, Dilip, you know, the kind of atmospherics he's been able to create everywhere, wherever he has gone abroad, you think he's redefining India in the eyes of the, in, in the, eyes of the foreigners? By doing, what, is his, what, what do you think is, is his, you know, intention when he goes and does these kind of things? Manoj used the word of our, our batsman going out to bat. But I think this is a prime minister who is acting like a CEO on a road show. He's on a road show. He's on a constant road show. He's on a constant road show selling India. And the audiences he's selling to are three. World leaders. Uh, bilateral, you know, uh, managers of bilateral uh, engagement and the NRI audience back there. And he recognized the use of each of these three. It depends on what's going to happen domestically, how useful any of this is going to be. Here is a man who's done a bunch of road shows now and he's got to come back, present his budget in February 2015 and then wait for the investments to flow. Because unless he's able to show, you know, unless he's able to show real hard progress in terms of economic development, uh, and by development here he means actually GDP growth, unless he's able to do that, there isn't so much more to react because, you know, no, while but, the, but no, but let us not look at what will happen in the future, but this, what, you, what we witness on, on television screens, the kind of atmospherics which are created, you know, one of the things which, which, stri which is striking is, there have been any number of prime ministers who have brought, Indian prime ministers who have drawn abroad. Why is it that, you know, you have this kind of atmosphere, this kind of excitement among the NRIs, especially about an Indian prime minister? Is it something which is spontaneous? There is spontaneity and there is genuine affection for the fact that somebody is reaching out to the common NRI Indian. Don't forget that Indian prime ministers in the past have done these high, you know, high, high level, uh, you know, black tie kind of official functions and have reached a certain kind of Indian who lives in these countries. But actually, politicians in these countries recognize when there is a man who connects with large numbers of people. Filling up a stadium with more people than Mick Jagger is serious stuff in Australia. You know, filling up Madison Square Gardens in that he did, he has become a kind of global rock star. And that's the new idiom. You know, many of today's leaders with the exception of a few, Obama and Cameron perhaps, are not yet able to get themselves onto the stage where they can actually connect with tomorrow's audiences, the youth audience. And this is where Narendra Modi is masterly. He is, I've, I've already said before, but he is probably the greatest event manager this country has ever seen. Uh, you know. Manu, Manoj, you know, is, it, is, it, is it because, I'll come to you also on this question, Mr. Bhadar Kumar. Uh, Manoj, you have been traveling, you have seen with, you have been with prime ministers, you have gone abroad. Is it, is it the fact that the NRIs and the OCIs, are, they all, were they feeling neglected by the, by, by the Indian government, the Indian ministers when they used to visit these countries and now suddenly they find themselves as the center of attention? Is that what it is all about? Well, you know, in part, certainly it's that. The thing is that if you look at our NRI community in the United States, basically it, start, it got going in the 60s. And then you had a long period because, you know, in the United States, for an average job, you get about 12 days leave. And uh, so it was traffic difficult. 
now you are in the jet era many of these people have done well and they have prospered and they have they are second generation uh, uh, people established australia the in, uh, in uh, the indian community is even younger meaning it they started really going about 10 years ago now the way i see it is something else meaning one is of course yes they feel uh, they they get attention they feel wanted but the nri peculiar character you know the nri uh, the indian nri loves politics you know he he is very much into politics if he is not directly in politics he likes to fund politics if you look at the number of people who are contesting uh, completely out of proportion for the, you know you won't find chinese americans contesting chinese and there are many more chinese americans you you won't find iranian americans you know there are th three times more iranian americans than there are uh, indian americans but the indian american likes politics loves politics he wants to intervene you know he's constantly um, uh, has that kind of a feeling but the way i see it is that modi has done something very smart he's actually using them it's not you see the nri is no great investor in india exactly. he's not uh, he's not an entrepreneur he's not going to invest in india yes he may be a source of remittances but that poor guy is in the gulf you know the remittance guy he's in the gulf uh, he's not in america or in australia what modi has done is by landing up in madison square garden then going to washington basically he gave a signal to obama meaning it is obama and the american administration who suddenly when they uh, saw this whole madison square garden thing they suddenly realized that here is a different kind of an indian leader they had to take note of that so he repeated that performance in australia that by going there i think he uh, what he showed local politicians is that you know you have this community here this community is a very political community and look i have a measure of this community this community can support you and you know american presidents um, they get a lot of funding from the indian american right. the american politicians right. so i think don't forget that aspect of this okay. badra kumar how do you look at this and so I, you know what what is it what is it what is going to yield out of all this excitement yeah, which yeah, it's a very very uh, very pertinent question you know because i think at the end of the day uh, we tend to exaggerate the significance of it this is my honestly my opinion uh, it is warranted it is quite understandable and it is in consonance with the political personality of mr modi there no quarrel about it but it's uh, easy for us to exaggerate its significance for india's foreign policy needs at this time particularly in structuring a foreign policy orientation as uh, professor mentioned earlier uh, which is as an extension of the development agenda as to provide the underpinning for the development agenda i don't what extent this is important you know uh, and if you actually look at the speech yesterday of the prime minister in sydney it is completely about india only it's about india and uh, at that same time uh, it was all, there he was trying to connect with the audience but actually if you uh, grish if you had looked at the australian media it was saturated with the coverage of president xi jinping's visit at the same time it overshadowed the minister's visit because what is australia australia is a country which is very clear headed that all politics is finally about Economics. creating wealth and you know that yeah, and it's very serious about it so in that kind of a country to some extent yoga cricket hockey mahatma gandhi vivekananda all this you can talk about a festival of india and all that it creates a feel good but at the end of the day how do you garner it because as i said in the beginning there is a phenomenal shift which is taking place in the in the in the in the in the asia pacific region and it is all uh centered around the economic drama right you know all the countries are aspirational today it's a high growth area and you're talking about big money chinese have put for instance on the silk road it's 40 billion dollars and you know you have the asian uh, infrastructure investment bank right you have two regional uh, trade uh, free trade agreement processes underway projects so everyone is talking big you know in fact you know it's very interesting uh, a similar personality like mr modi at a similar point of time has come up in australia i uh, come up in indonesia jokowi right now jokowi's remarks as he headed back arthur i was reading it with much interest in the indonesian press today he said that you know the time for grandstanding is over he was referring to his predecessor okay and he said at the end of it i would like to draw the thing and say how does it benefit my country and i am going to develop relationship he was talking about indonesia coming back to a fruitful relationship with china so now you see this is the this is the main theme in the region and unless we are in sync with him we'll get left behind no but professor goshal you you think 
Prime Minister Modi seems to be in sync with with the team because everywhere he's talking about because the right. I mean, if, I think, if you look at if you look at the analyst, if you read what he's saying, he's he's saying the right things. He's saying the right things, all right. But the thing is that the point that uh, Mr. Bhadra Kumar had raised about the propitious moment, you know, any other prime minister, to my mind, at this juncture, would have received quite a lot of attention. The fact that Manmohan Singh could not have made that kind of an impact, maybe because of his own personality, but I think the timing and the kind of developments that are taking place in the region, I think that particularly bring certain attention towards countries like India, right. Indonesia. And in many respects, again, Mr. Bhadra Kumar had mentioned about Djokovic. I think in many respects, the two countries, the two democracies, you know, interestingly had a lot of similarities, similarities in terms of their approaches, the way the elections took place and the kind of outsiders that were brought into the political process. And both the leaders have been, you know, emphasizing the relationship between development and foreign policy, the domestic constant, I mean, sort of emphasis and all that. So I think these are the ish things that need to be really observed rather than talking in terms of, you know, in a visionary kind of a language. I think some of this nitty gritty stuff need to be picked up by our foreign policy makers and then integrate it into our making. Of, you know, for example, Indonesia for the first time, you know, has made a, an interesting observation about its future role. Earlier, its defense doctrine never talked about Indian Ocean. It was more Pacific. ASEAN, Australia, United States. Now, for the first time, Djokovic has articulated a policy of bridging the two oceans, in Pacific and so Indian Ocean. So, what is it? What, and, is, what is the message to India? In and I think India has to take note of all that and okay. has to engage, you know, countries like Indonesia much more effectively. Okay, but Dilip, Dilip, you know, I'm sure the Prime Minister, his, his advisors, his brand manager, you know, his brand managers or whatever, are aware of all these things which are happening. You know, by doing this, I'm sure they're all aware that, you know, you're creating these huge expectations because you'll have to start delivering, you'll have to start showing very soon. So you think that, you know, this is something which is, a, you, you think there's a short-term uh, agenda of his that, you know, to create this kind of excitement wherever he goes and then get, by, get down to work. Like in any road show, the idea of a roadshow is to attract investment. Right. And I think that's his game plan. He needs to get, uh, he needs to show that there is a flow of money interest. And money interest means manufacturing. Of course, on the river side, don't forget that Mr. Adani has gone and invested $7 billion in Australia. So... 16.5. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. When, 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 when it's fin finished. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, the with fact... A, with a $1 billion loan from State Bank yeah, of India. But the f is that this is a prime minister who is out there to get attention and thereby money and thereby investment and thereby jobs. He sees this as a straight line thing. It's not, uh, I'm not sure whether he's thinking short term, but for the moment, he's thinking in terms of immediate term returns, this is what he's looking what for. Is it, what is the immediate return which he can The do? immediate return, return he expects an increased flow of investment from these countries in terms it of is, business. Nothing, so it has nothing to do with his own image, the building up his own image and things I like that? I think the image building up, you know, it would be unfair to say, is entirely personality driven. It is, he's taking advantage of it, but he knows that, for example, our uh, pretty tenuous relationship with China. He knows that he needs to open up this ASEAN and you know East Asian front to make sure that people there recognize that there is a change, a shift in gears. A in different, India. a different leader here, Manoj. You know, when when, when he was there with the G20 leaders, and uh, he, he was talking of black money, you know, bring back, and, and apparently the G20 leaders responded to it, and there is there is some kind of a uh, you know commonality in approach in issue. You think this is something which he has been able to, this is some gain as far as this visit is concerned? Well, definitely, you see, if you look at the G20 outcome, you see, uh, we call it black money, but you know, this is much more widely known as tax avoidance. Right. And many, many, many countries are concerned about this issue of tax avoidance because in this era of globalization, you have companies, you know, you have Apple playing, uh, paying virtually no tax in the US, they pay Ireland, which has very low taxation. So, you know, other countries are also concerned about this. Uh, in our uh, system, we call it black money, though uh, we all know that a lot of black money is in India itself, but we are really looking at creating 
a more transparent and more uh, uh, equitable tax structure uh, around the world which would benefit us. That is one issue. The second issue was reforming banking and banking to the point that you don't enter into another crisis. Right. Already we are hearing world leaders talking of a possible uh, uh, second crisis. You see? And if we set, and the G20 was a, was a platform where you're really setting the rules um, uh, for the uh, globalization process so that there is a win-win situation for all the countries involved, for all the G20 involved. That is why this G20 came after the, uh, the 2008 uh, crisis. And I think Mr. Modi put our, did put our best for, uh, foot forward there. Okay. Badr Kumar? As far as See, G20 is concerned. Yeah, as far as G20 is concerned, you know, we must understand that G20 was a concerted, very well thought out Western effort to shore up the Bretton Woods system in the aftermath of the financial crisis. You know, there is a challenge coming here from the emerging powers. But now you see the situation has changed. United States' growth rate has picked up 3%, you know. Europe already is certainly in some trouble. But United States is not, so in other words, there's no real challenge now to the Bretton Woods system that way. So if you see the G22, for example, you know, you had a very bizarre situation there where all this agenda that we would like to discuss was, became a sideshow. Right. And it just was taken over by Ukraine. You know, and the spirit of the and new then, Cold War. And, and then Russian know? president had to, had to leave before uh, he was supposed actually to. Actually, leave, leave, yeah. Now, the point is, uh, G20's future is, there is a question mark. Now, the good thing is that it is going into the hands of China, an emerging power. Now, what orientation China is prepared to give, you know, in terms of this, in terms of getting a bigger piece of the pie you know, for emerging powers and, you know, India included. Uh, remains to be seen. Uh, so, B uh, B but G20 you think is that caught you, in a kind but, of a twilight zone. But do you think that B Narendra Modi has made an impact? At you the see, G20? this laundering, money laundering business was in the agenda. Now, no, in no international conference, when the leaders come there, more than photo op, any negotiations Nego take place. <laughs> okay. What BRICS, BRICS leaders meet, you know, because parallelly that also happened and uh, uh, was it was it intended to... No, to give some signal to the G20 leadership, this BRICS leaders meet? Uh, I don't think that it had any much of an impact there because uh, I think these are issues which again had a uh, focus in the domestic politics to a large extent. And in fact, I'll go back a little bit with, uh, yes, Modi has been able to create an image of a person who will deliver things. That image is more or less accepted now. But I think much will depend on how he's able to bring about, you know, changes within the country. The Reform. Plus, you know, again, you know, the big thing, as again Mr. Badru Kumar has mentioned, that the economic integration and the economic play that is going on within the region, to what extent India will be able to, you know, contribute and that process of regional integration and to okay. what extent India will be able to, you know, integrate itself with the economy of that region. Okay, Dilip, that very, itself will be a Dilip, very quickly, you think the, this, these, visit, these visits to different uh, places, meeting so many leaders, has enhanced the stature of Narendra Modi internationally? It definitely has in, enhanced both, you know, don't forget he came in on a back foot. Right. And now it's a Modi already in the first six months who is on a front foot. He's on probably on first name basis with all the male leaders. He's at a place where his image, uh, having been uh, taken stratospheric in terms of where he was, has also pulled India's image to a certain extent. Well, Manoj, very quickly, same question. Well, you know, uh, as I said, that the batsman has gone out to play, and the batsman, as I said, he's our star batsman, and I think. It's very clear that he has signaled new era. I think that kind of a signal has gone across the world. Now I think the real issues are at home because investment is not going to come in just because you've gone and said that we are, we, we, uh, our shop is open. Investment will come in when you do substantive things back home. Okay. All those companies know that and they're looking out for that. Okay, I think on that note we need to end. It's, it's a job well done as far as the visit is concerned, kind of... Uh, you know, image he has built up and all, but now he needs to get down to do the job and, and convince all those leaders and the people around the world that 
what he has promised he'll be able to deliver, which is something which we'll all need to wait, wait and watch. Thanks to all my guests, Mr. Badra Kumar, Baladas Goshal, Dilip Charyan and Manoj Joshi and Dr. Didar Singh, who had, whose uh, connection we lost earlier. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come with another issue of the big picture same time tomorrow.